Well, good morning, Lionhearts. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? Well, I'm glad to hear that. Today is going to be a very sad day for me, but also, in a way, kind of a happy day because I get to turn a lot of you on to a band and a man that you've probably never heard of, although you should have because he was amazing. On the heels of us just going to Elvis's house and Jerry Lee Lewis's house, I think this guy, though unsung for his time, to me, had the same impact that those same people had on me. So today I want to talk about a man most well known as probably Sparkle Horse, but his real name was Mark Linkus. And Mark created some of the most beautiful music, some of the saddest music, some of the most interesting music for 15 years from pretty much 1995 till his death in 2010 here in Knoxville. I wanted to do this vlog so bad that I told myself the last time I was in Tennessee, you are not going to Tennessee again without doing a vlog on Sparkle Horse because this man deserves it. And so today I'm going to, unfortunately, here in Knoxville, tell you about how he passed away. But throughout the day, I'm going to explain to you why he was so amazing and sadly the tumultuous life that he lived. Today we're going to have an entire vlog on the life and death of Sparkle Horse. Mark Linkus, Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. And since Mark's love other than music, he didn't even call himself a songwriter. He called himself a conductor, mostly. He said he realized that his purpose in life was just to bring joy through music to people and to get it out into the world. So he spent most of his life surrounding himself with nature, his motorcycles, his Dodge Charger, and today I'm going to try and include as much nature as I can in telling his story. So I thought it might be nice to tell his story through a little bit of this nature preserve. So Mark has been described by friends as being someone who would take a perfect and beautiful song and then feel the need to drive a truck over it. <laughs> now to me, that's kind of what made his music so amazing was that he saw that the beauty and the noise around you, whether it be a phone ringing, your neighbor's car starting, a lawnmower, whatever it be, those kinds of sounds were musical to him. And he, <laughs> growing up, his parents got a divorce, his mom had a factory job, and he was falling into a crowd that was not what he should be falling into. And he had befriended some pagan motorcycle gang members. So his mom said, this is not a good idea and sent him to Virginia to live with his grandfather and grandmother who was a pretty strict coal miner. So his grandfather, although being strict, also was very generous and um, bought Mark his first leather, leather jacket, bought him his first guitar, and Mark started learning how to play guitar through the 70s, that was his obsession. His grandmother would even make mock Jimmy Page outfits for him to wear. And his goal immediately became, once I graduate high school, I'm gonna be in punk music. I'm gonna go play in a punk rock band. So he took off to New York, joined a band called The Dancing Hoods, and played there quite extensively. The band became pretty popular, and then they moved out to Los Angeles looking for a record deal. The band ended up falling apart, but during that time, he ended up opening for Camper Van Beethoven, who one of the lead members of that band would become one of his best friends. Now, that was David Lowry. David Lowry would also be in the band Cracker. So Mark eventually, when the band broke up, they didn't end up getting a record deal. He moved back to Virginia with his wife, Teresa, who was also from a small town of Virginia, and they just thought it made the most sense. He was totally disillusioned with pop music and said he didn't want to play pop at all. And when he made it back to Virginia, he started playing in a Gaelic band. He said it was really a, like a realization for him one day playing in a cabin with these other guys playing like 100-year-old Celtic songs and realizing that this moment that it wasn't being recorded or anything but this moment was what mattered that music was echoing through that room and out the windows and out through the trees and the forest and everything and he said somewhere maybe infinitely it was still going or maybe it just evaporated into the air but he said that moment he realized that was all that mattered it wasn't pop music it wasn't stardom it was making something that was beautiful and captured a moment and that's really what his music would end up being for the entirety of his short career. 15 years 
four full albums, but from beginning to end, perfection. In my opinion, Sparkle Horse, every single album was perfection. Now, when David Lowry moved to Virginia, he moved to Richmond, which is where Mark was living with his wife. They got in contact because Mark had opened for his band and they started recording music together and David actually gave Mark his first Tascam recorder and that's what Mark would start recording what would become the first album of Sparkle Horse, Viva Dixie Submarine Transmission Plot, which was a title he derived from a dream he had about General Robert E. Lee in a submarine with a marching band. Now if you ask me, David Lowry was like the perfect person to enter Mark's world because David Lowry was very inventive and musical in his own right. And so they would bounce ideas off each other. And Mark ended up getting a six-figure deal from Capitol Records from Gary Gersh, the same man who years before had signed Nirvana, took a chance and in the mid-90s decided to put Mark Linkus Sparkle Horse on Capitol Records. Now you're going seriously Capitol Records? Yeah, believe it or not, Capitol Records in the mid 90s was really cool. They were really hip and they were signing artistic alternative bands that maybe weren't gonna sell a million records or you know go platinum or anything, but he, he recognized that it was worth putting great music out there. So Sparkle Horse got to put out the record that he wanted, which was a lot of those home recordings, the album is fantastic beginning to end. Um, if you listen to Saturday, The Most Beautiful Widow in Town, um, Someday I'll Treat You Good, the whole album is perfection. Weird Sisters, Homecoming Queen, I just don't think there's a bad song on there, but he was not a musician who based his albums around a song or trying to hook you in with one song. It really was a full experience, so thank God for Capital understanding the vision of Mark. Now, however, Mark put that record out and it was kind of lukewarm sales, especially for, you know, like a band that was on Capitol Records. They weren't doing very well. However, he was out there opening for Sunvolt and Vic Chestnut, who he became good friends with later on, which I'll tell you about. But Radiohead ended up hearing that album while they were touring on the Benz and they fell in love with it and they contacted um, Sparkle Horse and said that they wanted him to go off and support them as an opening act for their tour. So that's exactly what happened. Mark went off, did the first leg of the tour. He had suffered his whole life with um, dramatic depression. I mean, this was one of those things, sometimes it was pretty debilitating and he would have bouts on and off with drug issues because of it. He was now seeing a psychiatrist or a therapist who had him on a medication that seemed to be regulating him. And even though he was really nervous about performing with Radiohead, he just didn't want to pass up that kind of opportunity. So he was on um, a break in between legs of the tour when his therapist switched his medication and um, he didn't tell anybody. And someone had given him before he took off on that second leg, a full bottle of Mexican Valium. Uh, because Mark had troubles with uh, insomnia. So he had taken both of those pills together and after a sound check in London, in his hotel room, he literally just collapsed straight down onto his knees and that's where he remained in that position for 14 hours until a hotel employee, I believe it was a house cleaner, came in and found him there. So they called the paramedics, the paramedics came, and he had been in a position where it had cut off circulation to his legs. So the first thing they did was try to straighten out his legs and the buildup of potassium in his system from having the um, circulation cut off caused a heart attack. And he immediately had a heart attack. His uh, kidneys, I believe, started shutting down and he ended up dying. He was dead on the table for the first time in London while supporting Radiohead. So they actually said that Mark was going to have to have both legs amputated. He ended up having um, health issue after health issue while he was in the hospital for this. Like I said, he ended up having to go on dialysis. He had died. They had brought him back and then told his wife he's going to lose his legs. There's just no way. And she apparently would massage his legs every day and talk to them and somehow he was able to keep his legs. However, they had become so swollen 
that they ended up cutting both legs down the center and leaving them open as he recovered from all this. So he ended up staying in the hospital for three months. You would think actually it would have been a whole lot longer, but it was the three month stint that he was in the hospital. David Lowry came to visit him and played a, one of Mark's favorite songs on a guitar and then left the guitar there for Mark, hoping that it would inspire him to get better. And um, once he got out of the hospital, he was in a wheelchair, he had leg braces, but just after three months, he wanted to get back out on the road and start performing, and he did. He started touring again from a wheelchair, and um, it was just very strenuous on him. Um, he was having horrible pains and ended up going to the Cleveland Clinic eventually where they figured out what the problem was. Zipline areas, huh? Holy cow, look at all that. What we wandered into. So what the doctor found out was that Mark was having serious phantom limb um, syndrome where basically like if you have something amputated, people sometimes feel like their nerves respond poorly to that and that's what he was having even though he kept his limbs he was having basically what as he described it his nerves were freaking out constantly and um he actually wanted to commit suicide during this time he said if his wife hadn't have hidden his guns he definitely would have done it because the pain was excruciating so they ended up finding out what that was they gave him a prescription for that but then they also put him on morphine because his legs were constantly in pain his whole body was he was always having migraines he had severe depression from all this and um you know obviously giving somebody who had had drug issues in the past morphine probably wasn't the best idea but that's really that was a necessary evil for getting him through this whole process and he got addicted to it and developed a, um, a heroin addiction and eventually from it as well. Now, one thing he did say was that he said his wife would read him letters from fans um, while he was in the hospital and that's really what kept him going. That's, he said it, it just kind of dawned on him that he was a conduit. That was his job. He was a conduit for beautiful music to get to people, to bring joy to their lives. And that that was what was going to inspire him and keep him wanting to live. So he made another record, which is a beautiful record, uh, Good Morning Spider. And the album is mainly about his time in the hospital, his thoughts in the hospital, what he wanted to do when he got out of there, his just emotions. And it's a beautiful, brilliant album. Um, and that's also when he discovered Daniel Johnston's music and ended up doing a cover of a Daniel Johnston song on there. He wrote a song specifically about the hospital that I love that I highly recommend called St. Mary, but also um, Come On In, Hundreds of Sparrows, all those songs are just amazing. The problem was is that because of what had happened to him, he said whenever he got a review for the album, they never talked about the music. They only wanted to talk about how he lived, like how he didn't die. And so it really never got the respect that he felt that it should have gotten. And um, it was after this that he found out that even though he was a guy who enjoyed being alone or being with his wife, being with animals out in the woods, being away from people, he had found out that some of his favorite musicians were actually fans of his, PJ Harvey, Tom Waits, and went out of his way for like the first time in his personality to get a hold of them and he became friends with them. And so when he started working on his next project, um, which was actually one that he was very upbeat and positive about it was the it's a wonderful life sessions he would end up getting them to make guest appearances on the album and he said it wasn't like he was trying to do something where there was a bunch of guest stars it was just he was more open to recording in a real studio and trying different methods and he wanted to go where like Tom Waits and PJ Harvey were comfortable because he knew that would put him into a different comfort zone and help them connect to him a little bit better so the album was released like a week from when 9-11 happened and he went from being ultra positive to literally saying in interviews he felt like it was the revelation that this was the end of the world and he fell into a severe depression. His, um, he had several family members and friends close to him die. He was having bad migraines again, severe depression, and um, the drugs took over. He made a great record. The album is just absolutely fantastic. But when he went on to make the next record, he started feeling the effects of having writer's block. So Mark was in the throes of maybe the hardest depression of his life, believe it or not, and he just he just couldn't even get out of bed. He'd, he would have no reason, he wouldn't even eat, he would 
continue doing heroin and um, just kind of gave up on things. So one of his friends said, Mark, you can't live like this and talked him out into moving away from Virginia and to North Carolina to get away from the people that he knew that could sell him drugs. Problem was his friend said, you know, when you're hooked to heroin, it's like you can find that anywhere. There's always somebody that will sell you that. So unfortunately, even though he went to North Carolina and set up a studio and was trying, he just wasn't pulling out of this. So what ended up happening was he heard the Danger Mouse Gray album where he had mixed the Beatles white album and Jay-Z's black album and he loved it and he reached out to Danger Mouse. They ended up having a um, back and forth and they became fast friends and Brian Burton helped pull him out of his depression. I just looked up and realized that in the midst of all that zip line that's closed, they actually have a little tree house up there. It's really cool. So Brian helped pull Mark out of this by coming to visit and he said, my goal was just to get him out of bed. Just get Mark out of bed, get him wanting to do stuff again. Not so much even make music, but as a result of getting him up and getting him out doing things, he did start making music again. And he would start working on a project with Brian that would be called Dark Night of the Soul. And this was something that Brian basically said, hey, let's just collaborate make the music, you don't have to worry about writing lyrics or singing any of it, and we'll get our friends to sing it. And so that's what they did. Brian got Iggy Pop and people like that on there. Um, Mark got Flaming Lips and people like that on there. And eventually, after a long, long time, that record did finally come out. But sadly, Mark was having trouble working on what would be his fourth record, and that's what in between all this, he would be working on with Brian, he would be working on it with Dave Friedman, who was the famed producer, the Flaming Lips, and they would even get the Flaming Lips guys to help record stuff on there, but he would go do a session with them and then call Dave and say, you know what, that sucked, just erase the whole thing, I'm ashamed of the whole, the whole um, session. And it was like, he just wasn't happy with anything, but he did eventually worked together with various people and he put together his fourth release um, drummed for light years in the belly of a mountain which is fantastic and it really is i think it's maybe the most um overall not best album but it's the best version of like if you were going to make one thing that wrapped up all of sparkle horse in one thing this really brought all eras of his music all of his albums into one project I actually got lucky and got to see him in concert at the Henry Fonda Theater in 2007 supporting this record. I had been a fan since pretty much the first album came out and um, I'd never got to see him live. And finally I got to, and to be honest with you, it was, I remember saying at the time, this is the perfect show. He played 15 songs, an hour and 20 minutes and he was done. There was like, you never had that moment where you said, he's playing too long, he's playing too short. It was just perfect. But in preparing and reading up on what I wanted to talk about in this vlog, I didn't know until now, that night after the show, Capitol Records told him that they would no longer be releasing his music and that their uh, business relationship was now over, which was a devastating blow to Mark because that was one of the things that always kept Mark going. Other than his wife always being in his corner, Teresa, it was also that Capitol Records always had his back in releasing his music and now he didn't have them. He had an addiction that he had overcome at this point. And while touring, he actually put together a band of people that literally were either survivors from drug addiction or understood the process and would work not only to be in the band but to help keep him off drugs. And finally, after that happened, um, he had a really bad show at Coachella and his bass player said, Mark, your legs are always in pain. These are hot shows. You have no support from a label anymore. Is this really worth it? Is this really what you want to do anymore? And um, he fell into a depression and kind of quit working on things for a little while again. So now I'm going to take us to the neighborhood where Mark was living at the time of his passing. So Mark did start a fifth record, even though he was 
at maybe one of his lowest points, he did try and start working on a fifth record, and he did it with Steve Albini, who was probably, well, for me, it was uh, Nirvana in Utero. He produced that, and he produced a great be uh, Breeders record, but he ended up working with him, and apparently these were much different than what Sparkle Horse songs were like before. These were kind of all over the place. Um, I read that the bandmate Scott Miner said um, that Basically, it was like jam songs, simple songs, and Mark said he just really wanted to make like a Buddy Holly record. He wanted to make like something very straightforward and accessible, kind of like what at the very beginning he was trying to get away from. He only ever did scratch takes on that session because he had a very scratchy voice. Apparently, he was drinking a lot um, of whiskey at that time, and he just um, couldn't couldn't do his vocals and had only really written dummy lyrics. So. He uh, went back to North Carolina, and from what I read, his wife, Teresa, after 19 years, had decided that she was going to leave the marriage. And um, Mark's friend Scott was living here in Knoxville and told Mark, you know, come visit. And so for different times and different over a span of months, um, Mark would come here and visit. He would make friends. He would kind of start socializing, which was not something he was known to do, and he was getting really comfortable here. And so Scott offered for him to come and stay at his house while Mark figured out what his next move was gonna be without Teresa. So now we're in the neighborhood of where um, Mark had moved into. Now sadly what happened was Mark had started moving his things um, on March 5th. He had piled up a bunch of things in his car and moved them from North Carolina to the house here. And then stayed the night, woke up the next day, and was going to um, go and pick up the rest of his stuff to move here. However, apparently he got a late start to the day, and while he was having his breakfast, he got a bunch of text messages. Uh, I couldn't find anywhere what they were and who they were from, but they clearly put him in a very sad and distraught state, and um, his friend Scott, it was at his house that we're gonna see. Scott said, Mark, are you okay? What, what, what's with the messages? And he said, it's not good. That was what Mark said, it wasn't good. So Mark went up and changed his clothes and put on a sparkle horse t-shirt, a flannel shirt and a jacket, and um, went for a walk, apparently. Went for a long one hour walk and then came back and went upstairs and grabbed um, an assault rifle that he had bought and he went out back. So they're actually renovating the house now, but it was in a spare bedroom here that um, Mark was living, and he went outside to have a smoke. Took that rifle out back, went to have a smoke, and, um, well, let's go look at the alley. This is, this is so sad for me. I, I love this guy's music. What, to me, I, I liked his music more than most bands you can think of. Beatles, you know, Bruce Springsteen, they didn't hold a candle to me to Sparkle Horse. So it was in this alleyway that Mark went out to have his last cigarette. Now he had apparently been drinking from the time that he got those messages and um, he came out here, had one last cigarette and then pointed the rifle at his heart and shot himself and took his own life. What was really sad was that um, his friend Scott that was living here immediately came out and saw him and said it wasn't like a, a bloodbath or anything. Said it was just, he said he was just laying there and he said, don't worry Mark, you're gonna be okay. And um, that was it, Mark was dead. His blood alcohol level was five times the legal limit at the time. The description I found said that Mark was laying at the, uh, the base of a pink door back here. So the police photo that we found was um, actually matching up right here. So here's the crime scene photo. And that's where I'm standing right now. So the photo that I found shows the matchup right here and that the police tape was right here. We noticed the little blue tarp down here. So this is a red door, but I bet this was it. 
but that was the pink door. Apparently, after it happened, it was just one shot, and he was laying there with his lighter at his side, the casing and the gun, and his friend Scott came out and, um, you know, found him. It's just so sad that he had to be the one to find him. So for quite a while I would look and they never had any kind of gravesite or anything for Mark that I could find and all I was ever able to find was that his ashes were divided up amongst four family members and um, I was able to get in touch with Scott and Scott said that Mark's wife Teresa did scatter his ashes in a place that Mark would have wanted. But there is in Virginia a headstone for Frederick Mark Linkus um, that fans can go visit and I just, I hate to like you know glorify anyone's death or anything but for some reason sometimes hearing about a tragic ending draws people to maybe understand the art more and if i can get more people just to listen to sparkle horse out of this vlog to me it's it's a big deal since mark never finished the fifth album he never put final vocal tracks or anything on it his family decided or his estate decided never to release it they've never sanctioned any tribute albums or any documentaries to my knowledge and when one documentary was made they were not able to get the rights they couldn't finance the rights for Mark's music for the documentary so I just feel like a lot of his history has been or will be forgotten rest in peace Mark what a beautiful soul and like his song, he lived it, it was a sad and beautiful world. I did reach out to Scott Miner who was in Sparkle Horse pretty much from the time the first album was finished through the end and um, unfortunately he moved to Greece so he couldn't help me out with being in the vlog and helping to remember Mark but he did tell me when I asked him about the grave and everything, I, you know, he was the one that told me that Mark's wife was the one that scattered his ashes and when I looked into finding his wife I was sad to learn that five years, well almost six years to the day, one day shy of six years after Mark killed himself, his wife Teresa had an asthma attack and passed away. So Mark died on March 6th, 2010, and Teresa passed away on March 5th of 2016. May they both rest in peace. It was sad, I had read that Scott said in an interview at one point that, you know, nobody saw this coming because Mark didn't seem depressed. He looked like he was on the upswing. Everything seemed like it was a whole new outlook on life, though without Teresa, it would be a whole new life. But he said nobody really realized what a rock she was for him and how, how much or how often he was right close to the edge and that she saved him. So knowing that a divorce was coming was probably exactly what pushed him over the edge. And um, she had said later that she never filed any divorce papers, but his longtime manager um, said that, that the process had been started and that's why Mark was moving. I can't help but wonder if one of these upstairs bedrooms was his, his last bedroom. My friends, I hope you'll check out Sparkle Horse's music after seeing this vlog. In my lifetime, I can only think of two musical deaths that really, really impacted me. One being Mark's and one being Elliot Smith. So they both touched my soul in the same way. So I hope that you'll give them a try. Uh, Sparkle Horse wasn't about the individual songs necessarily always, but the album itself was always an amazing experience. And then once you sat and listened to each song individually, you saw how genius Mark Linkus really was. So please go give Sparkle Horse a listen. He definitely will touch your soul. Thank you all for watching. We're gonna call it a day. Thank you Patricia Ann Walsh, Sweet Susie, Deborah F, Robin Stacy Murray, and Patrick Verhuey for becoming my newest Patreons. Thank you all for giving this vlog your attention. Now go listen to Sparkle Horse. Mark deserves your love. Good night.